Welcome everybody to the second day of our um, Return of Intertwined conference. Um, uh, without further ado, um, we'll, we have Pablo uh, Yairo Herrero as our first speaker. He's going to tell us about competing orders, mimeticity and phase transitions in twisted by layer graph in magic angle graphing that's twisting away in front of our eyes right now. Pablo, please. Thank you very much, Una. And I want to start by thanking the organizers, Steve, Rafael, Erez, and Una for the invitation to, to give this talk. You know, I, I wish I was really here in the background. You know, I'm actually stuck at my place in Cambridge, but uh, hopefully in the near future we'll be able to all meet in person again. So I want to tell you uh, about, you know, recent experiments in magic angle graphene and related to the topic of this conference, Company Orders, Nematicity, et cetera. So just because I imagine uh, there might be a number of people who are not so familiar with this, let me um, tell you that this is a topic, you know, the field of correlated more heterostructures, which has meant the merging of, you know, various condensed matter communities, which did not sometimes interact that strongly before. This is the 2D Van der Waals materials and heterostructures community, graphene, for example, and they have more, uh, you know, strongly correlated materials, you know, cuprates, nictites, et cetera, and then also the topological condensed matter physics community, all of these come together in these correlated more heterostructures. So I think this is a very rich field, and it's one where, you know, a lot of people are interacting which didn't interact so frequently before, and that's one of the things that I find personally most appealing, you know, and I'm learning so much from talking to so many of you. So just a reminder, you know, if, if you put two graphene sheets on top of each other, you have the direct cones of each of the graphene sheets, you know, in reciprocal space, they are separated by some distance. This distance is proportional to the twist angle for small angles. And this is a situation that would arise if you did not have, you know, if the electrons in one graphene sheet didn't know about the electrons in the other graphene sheet. But in reality, these two graphene sheets, when you put them on top of each other, they're only three angstroms apart. So the electrons can tunnel between the two layers. And it means that due to this interlayer hybridization, you have an opening of a gap there at the crossing point of these Dirac cones from each of the two graphene sheets. Now, as you can imagine, you know, this is a situation that occurs when this interlayer hybridization, you know, 2W is, you know, W is smaller than the actual crossing point that takes place there at that energy. But as you decrease the twist angle, this crossing point goes to lower and lower energy. So this lower band gets pushed to lower and lower energy. And at some point you develop into, you know, you go into something called as a flat band condition. And the angle for which that flat band condition appears is called the magic angle. This was a term coined by Bistritzer and McDonald. And there were, uh, you know, earlier already a uh, single particle, you know, uh, earlier scaling time in microscopy experiments by Ivan Dre that suggested that indeed there is a, you know, flat bands, the bandwidth of the system would go to, you know, very small to minimum uh, around the, uh, for this angle, you know, 1.16 degrees, you know, let me put it here. And also there were other calculations suggesting the existence of these flat bands. So this is something that, you know, remained, uh, you know, there was not too much attention for a while, but if you, you know, this, this is something that is a cartoon sort of that what I showed you. Let me show you an actual calculation about how this happens, okay? So this is, Again, the, the electronic structure, you know, the reciprocal space for the two graphene sheets, and this is the super lattice real one zone due to the Moray pattern that forms. And I'm gonna run this video. In this video, you're gonna see how the actual electronic structure changes as a function of twist angle. This is for large, relatively large twist angles, three degrees. You can see this looks just graphene, like graphene, you know, 60 dark cones, because within this energy window, that's what you get. Uh, as I reduce now the twist angle, you're gonna see that the first thing that happens is that this super lattice brilliant zone is gonna get smaller. That's because in real space, reducing the twist angle leads to a longer and longer moiré pattern, longer you know, moiré wavelengths. And so the reciprocal space becomes smaller and it's going to rotate and then the electronic structure is going to reconstruct. So as you can see, at about you know, two degrees within this energy window, now you see this set of bands, which is becoming flatter and flatter separated by band gaps from the upper band. There it became very flat, yeah? And that happened at around the magic angle, okay? Let me run it again. You see this set of bands, which is getting isolated from the other moiré bands by these band gaps. And 
it's becoming very flat at about 1.1 degree, okay? And then it continues evolving, you know, uh, in a complex manner. So once you, you know, once you include lattice relaxations, is, you know, this angle can be around 1.05 degrees, although the last digit on this angle, you know, continues to vary as more and more uh, better models are built for, for the electronic structure of magic angle graphene. Now, so, and then, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, we, you know, we, you know, we found out that, uh, you know, for samples that are, you know, whose twist angle is very close to this magic angle, you know, so within a small angular range of the order of, you know, 0.1 degrees or 0.15 degrees around this 1.1, then you obtain, you know, a set of correlated insulated states when you put an integer number of electrons per more unit cell, okay? For the original discovery, it was two electrons and two holes per more unit cell. And then if you dope a little bit away from it, you get superconducting dome. So magic angle graphene is a superconductor. Now, let me step a little bit back because I'm going to talk about the phase diagram. And, and let's go back to this, you know, phase diagram of graphene, which is also the same as large angle twisted by layer graphene. If you have temperature and charge density, okay, then at the charge neutrality point, you know, you have, you know, an interesting, you know, that's an interesting point, the only interesting line in this phase diagram. Away from that, this is purely metallic behavior. Charge at the point is semi-metallic because of the zero gap. It's a little bit more interesting. Now, what happens if you look at small twist angle, you know, twisted by layer graphene, small angle, but not yet magic. What happens is that, as you can see here, the electronic structure develops these sets of more bands, and you have these band gaps, you know, which separate you from this set of flatter bands and then to the next more bands. Now, I have changed the axis here from charge density to filling. Where filling, I mean, how many electrons per moiré unit cell are we putting, okay? So from charge neutrality, we can, you know, this, this entire, you know, this set of flat bands here, okay, is, contains, can contain up to eight electrons per moiré unit cell, which means from charge neutrality, if I go up, I reach this band gap when I put four electrons per moiré unit cell. If I go down from charge neutrality, I reach this band gap when I put four holes per moiré unit cell. Okay, when I remove four electrons per more unit cell. So in the phase diagram of small angle uh, twisted by layer graphene, you have now two you know, other interesting regions, which are these band insulators when you reach, you know, when you occupy your system, when you dope it with four electrons or four holes per more unit cell. And this was, you know, we, we, you know, we, we found out about this already a few years ago. It has been reproduced by a number of other people. Now, what happens if what you have is actually magic angle graphene, okay? So now small twist angle, but magic. So then this phase diagram back becomes more complex, okay? In the, you know, this was a phase diagram and, you know, sort of a schematic, but we paid too much attention to the details, schematic as of mid-2018. So you have correlated insulated states at two electrons, two holes per more unit cell. And then you have superconducting domes. Initially, we only saw it, uh, you know, on, on, on this side for holes, but then later on, you know, both we and it was reported uh, by collaboration by Corey Dean and Andrea Young. They also found, you know, superconducting domes for electrons. And I have to say that there was also related correlated insulated work on ABC trilayer graphene on HBN by the group of Feng Wan at Berkeley. So then the phase diagram continues to evolve, okay? And, you know, just if you look from global transport measurements, you have this phase diagram, which is sch still schematic, angle dependent and evolving quite fast. So you have, for example, that in addition to these things that I showed you before, you know, we have this region of linear in temperature resistivity, which is very reminiscent of strange metal behavior in other correlated systems. We, well, you know, the, uh, at other, you know, doping ranges, you have more metallic behavior. We have found out, and this is gonna tell you about nematicity in the superconducting state. We also have competing orders, okay, here near the top of the dome. We have also regions of rheumaticity or strong anisotropies in the normal state. And I'm not gonna talk about it, but at other, you know, this is happening around two holes, two electrons per more unit cell, but at one and three electrons and holes per more unit cell, a lot of other interesting physics is happening also, magnetism, you know, topology, and plenty of other things, okay? Which I don't have time to speak about. So then what I'm gonna tell you about is First, I'll tell you about our observation of competing orders, magic and graphene, the nematicity, and if I have time, I'll tell you about our latest uh, results regarding cascade of phase transitions and the revivals in the system. 
So I think, you know, the, you know this uh, competing intertwined orders, you know, some a term which is often, you know, used in, in many public materials, perhaps most famously in the cuprates. And here in a phase diagram of, of you know, of the cuprates temperature versus, you know, doping, you see that, for example, there is this, you know, region here where there's a lot of, you know, orders, you know, and it seems that in some cuprates, this presence of these orders can, for example, compete, you know, or get intertwined with superconductivity. For example, here, you know, it can lead to a suppression of TC so that you got, you have sort of two domes, you know, with a, with a you know, suppression of TC here. For some cuprates like LA, you know, LABACO, it's actually a almost complete suppression of TC, you know, due to stripes, you know, at this one eighth anomaly or, you know, 12% doping. Now let us, let me show you what happens when we measure our samples. So this is temperature versus charge density for one of our magic and graphene devices. It's a pretty high quality one. This is charge neutrality. It exhibits correlated semi-metallic or insulated states at one electron, two electrons, three electrons per mole unit cell. For holes, you see this region near two holes per mole unit cell where there is superconductivity. Let me zoom in a bit closer into this region, okay? By zooming into this region, again, temperature versus charge density, this is the correlated insulated state, which is quite weak for this particular device happening at two holes per mole unit cell. And then you have this superconducting dome. And you can see that there is this feature that comes from already from pretty high temperatures, okay? Let me show you here, okay? It's a resistance maximum here okay? versus density, local resistance maximum here. And it goes and it dips into there. Let me zoom in even more. Okay, remember this correlated insulated state happens for two holes per mole unit cell. This is zero doping. If you want to make analogy with other correlated materials, and then we add additional holes as we go in this direction. Okay, here is again this white, you know, this line which traces this local maximum in resistance. Okay, and you can see here that this is a superconducting dome which is a deep a depletion near here. So this is something that, again, in the cuprates, you go hold open in this direction, right? So, you know, when I saw it, you know, it reminded me very much of this, okay? Now you see it once and maybe you think like, well, I'm not sure what, what this feature is due to, but by now we have seen it in a number of uh, devices, you know, and in different material systems also. So, you know, when, you know it seems like this, feature here, which is going down to, at low temperatures, ultimately superconductivity wins, but it's depleting TC. So we thought, okay, it seems like this thing was, you know, it's competing with superconductivity, whatever this phase is. Why don't we suppress superconductivity by applying a small perpendicular magnetic field? And then we see what this thing really wants to do down here, okay? So this is the data at zero perpendicular magnetic field. We apply a small perpendicular magnetic field, and we see that this feature goes, develops into a strongly insulating state at zero temperature, okay? You can just take traces here where this feature is and where, you know, at finite field. And you can see that in one case it goes superconducting, in the other case it goes insulating when you have a small perpendicular magnetic field. And now you can, you know, do this in a different device. This is another device, 1.07 degrees. And we have also this feature which comes from high temperature, you know, which you know, bends a little bit. It creates, here the correlated insulated state is very weak actually, but this is, two holes per mole unit cell, and creates, this creates a small depression in TC here. If you now measure a finite magnetic field, you see that there is still the correlated insulated state at zero doping. At about 10% doping away from it, you have this strongly insulated state which connects with this, okay? And again, if you take traces there, you can see that this goes, you know, insulating at finite field, whereas it was superconducting at zero magnetic field. Okay, so there seems to be this, and you can do, of course, these measurements con sorry, continuously. Uh, yep. Uh, the question was asked, do you have an estimate for the energy gap of the insulating state? Um, so I forgot off the top of my head right now for this particular one, stronger than this one, which is typically of order, you know, less than a millivolt. Uh, for this one, I don't, uh, I don't have it right now at the top of my head. Okay. So you can do this actually continuously, okay? So this is, on this axis now, TC, okay? Measured at different magnetic fields. Actually, this is 
I mean, all of this is data points. These are just particular traces to guide you, but this is continuously. Everything that you see here is actual data, okay? There, I'm just selecting a few magnetic fields to guide your eye. You can see that at 90 millitesla, um, you have the superconducting dome splitting into two domes, and then at higher fields, only one of them remains. This is you know, somewhat reminiscent of what, for example, you know, Rad Ramshaw and collaborators have seen, you know, in cuprates where they see that they can also split the two superconducting domes at high fields, you know, by, uh, you know, when, when you trace, you know, TC as you increase to extraordinarily high fields. We can do this at much smaller fields because we have much more critical temperatures. And I want to draw your attention to the fact that this is all continuous data points in one system. These are discrete data points. These continuous lines are, are theory, uh, they're guide to the eyes, right? These are continuous Pablo? discrete points. Another yeah. question from yep. Eduardo. Is there evidence for symmetry breaking at this anomaly? Okay, I'm gonna go into this, okay? In a moment. So mm -hmm. let, me, let me leave it at that and I'm gonna return to this, okay? As, uh, after this next section. So now, let me talk about nematicity. So nematicity means spontaneous breaking of lattice rotational symmetry, some of the parameter. Many families of correlated materials show this. And it can happen in the normal state, in the superconducting state, or in both, and it has different implications in each case. Okay? This is a picture from one of our organizers, you know, famous review. You know, it has been explored extensively in the nictites, in the particularly in the normal state, but also in the superconducting state. There have been recent studies on doped topological insulators, which are superconductors, where they see also that the system goes, you know, from a threefold, you know, lattice rotational symmetry, it selects a direction, so it goes to a twofold symmetry, so an ellipse or a peanut, you know. You look, for example, at TC versus magnetic field angle, and you see that there is this, you know, two maxima, you know, meaning an ellipse, now, or, a, or a peanut, okay? Now, let me show you our data. So we have devices now magic angle devices. It's a pretty high TC device, three Kelvin, but we've measured this by now, you know, half a dozen devices. Very, you know, beautiful superconducting curves, you know. Now this is TC versus density. It's one of these devices where it has one of these anomalies, okay, here. And then if you measure resistivity versus in-plane magnetic field magnitude and direction, you see now these two maxima again, which means this thing has chosen a direction, the system has chosen a direction, it's telling us this is looking like an ellipse if you plot it in polar coordinates. So in this, let me show you the ellipse, this is resistivity versus magnetic field in the x and y direction, okay? This thing has a different critical magnetic field along this direction and along this direction, okay? And the nice thing about our system is that we can do this continuously as a function of density, so we can do this, you know, this is a, a particular intermediate temperature so that I can show you the behavior over, you know, doping in different dopings. Uh, it turns out we have a finite uh, vector magnet, a finite value of the magnitude of the magnetic field. So for example, at optimal doping, it's superconducting no matter what direction we put the field because we have a maximum uh, parallel field of one Tesla, okay? But for example, if you increase the temperature, then you can actually see that this is also an isotropic. So we have to do these measurements at different temperatures, at different dopings, depending on uh, how large TC is. You can find extensive data for all of this, much more than this in this paper, okay? These data points are taken at different doping levels here. And the thing that I want you to come across from this is the fact that, well, there is an ellipse, but as you can see, the ellipse orientation is changing with doping, okay? At this K point is like this, at this E point is like this. So just by changing, the charge density in the system, the leaps is changing, okay? And it's, now I'll tell you a bit more about that in a moment. So let me go back to the normal state. What about the normal state? What's going on there, okay? So this is the measurement that I showed you before of the resistivity for one of these samples, you know, where you have this feature, which is denting on TC there, okay? And here you have the correct insulated state for two holes for more unit cell. What happens if I now do, this is a whole bar sample, if I do a transverse measurement, like if I do a whole measurement, but at zero magnetic field, okay? If I measure R, X, Y. In principle, I should get zero, if the, you know, but actually we find, okay, if we measure a strong R, X, Y signal, 
And the region where this is strongest, I don't want you to look at, you know, for colors which are light. I want you to look at dark colors like this. It's a very dark color, okay? So if I just put this line, you know, that I find from RSX measurements directly on top of it without adjustments, you can see that this region of, you know, strong RXY coincides in extent, you know, in doping and temperature range uh, with that line, okay? Uh, Pablo, uh, yeah. Pablo, there was a question, I think it's maybe two slides back. When you were showing an isotropy, uh, yeah. this is a question from Aaron Hui. Uh, the, the question is what sets the orientation Perhaps I think the question is like whether the anisotropy direction has any uh, relation to the registry, like <laughs> yep. right BS. Yes. When you say BX, how does that relate to lattice? Yeah, no. So, so we don't know because we don't know the orientation of the lattice of the Moray lattice with respect to our whole bar axis. Okay, mm -hmm. so we don't know. We do know that it has nothing to do, for example, with in what direction we send the current. We can send the current in a perpendicular direction, and the lift remains in the same direction. Okay. Mm -hmm. We also know that it is unlikely to be fixed by, let's say, a very strong strain because the ellipse is rotating and the strain will not, you know, rotate, will not change as we vary the density over very small changes in density. Okay. So I'll comment a little bit more about that, you know, in a moment. So, okay. so what about this normal state? Again, we measure this region of strong RXY. How come we can have some RXY? Okay. So, Let's imagine you have a material system which has an isotropy, okay? So this is the resistivity, and it has different resistivity in the X direction and in the Y direction, row one and row two. You have a whole bar sample, and your X and Y axis for your device, for your whole bar, are aligned to your one and two axis, okay, for your crystals, okay? Then you expect to measure zero transverse resistance, even if you have some anisotropy. However, in general, we don't know what is the orientation of our, you know, if in a material where you don't know what is the orientation of your anisotropy axis with respect to your device axis, okay? When you measure resistivity, you have to do a rotation, okay? And then you can measure a finite transverse, you know, rho x y, even at zero magnetic field, okay? As long as you have the presence of anisotropy and you don't have an angle which is, you know, sine to theta is equal to zero, okay? So it is in our case, we do not know what is the direction of our anisotropy axis with respect to the Holbar sample, okay? The fact that, you know, we have this strong anisotropy at zero magnetic field, and here I'm actually plotting the data, correcting, you know, correcting for all possible geometric factors, like for example, a finite offset between RXX electrodes, et cetera, okay? And the thing just gets even stronger when you correct for those factors, okay? You can also normalize Rxy by Rxx, okay, which gives you a measure of what is, you know, the anisotropy compared to the actual value of the resistivity, and you can see that it reaches values of 50%. It's a very strong anisotropy. This is not a small effect, okay? So, and it happens again in this region. So the picture that, you know, oh, and by the way, I should mention that pneumaticity in the normal state has been also seen in recent STM work by, you know, the Columbia group and by Ivan Dre's group also, and by Caltech group um, uh, doing STM, okay, in the normal state. Though I don't think they have such a detailed study of the doping as, as, as dependence as we have here. So the picture that is emerging is the following. We have, okay, I'm looking here at the region around two holes per mole unit cell, so filling minus two, okay. We have a correlated insulated state at two holes per mole unit cell. We dope with extra holes and we have a superconducting dome. That superconducting dome often, in many devices, has a depletion somewhere around 10% doping, that order of magnitude, 10% doping. That region coincides with a region which in the normal state comes from high temperature where we have strong anisotropies in the normal state, okay? And separately, we see that everywhere in the superconducting dome, we have also strong anisotropies, in particular, the critical field, also the critical current as a function of magnetic field. I don't have enough time to show you here all this data, but you can look at it in this paper, okay? We have additional evidence of pneumaticity. Pablo, you have about five minutes left. Yep, sounds good. So then, in the superconducting them, everywhere we have these ellipses, okay? But in this region where above in the normal state, 
there's no substantial anisotropy. If this ellipse rotates only a little bit smoothly, okay? We do not know what's exactly pinning it. You know, maybe a little bit of strain is pinning a particular direction of the ellipse, but it's, you know, allowed to rotate smoothly, you know, because it's most likely electronically driven. And again, you can find more details about possible uh, models here. However, once we enter this open region, the direction of the lips changes very rapidly. It seems like whatever is set in the normal state and isotropy is also selling the system. Now I want you to choose this direction for the superconducting order parameter, because from here to here, the direction of the lips rotates strongly, okay? And this is the picture that is emerging. So now in the last you know, couple of minutes, let me just very quickly tell you that Okay, in this, you know, this is a different version of this strange diagram that I mentioned above, you know, with, you know, correlated insulator or semi-metallic states at each integer and some superconducting domes, etc. and the band insulators. Turns out that we have done some uh, thermodynamic measurements, you know, the compressibility, the inverse compressibility, actually, with the group of Shahlilani, and we have found that at each integer, you know, from before to after each integer, the system experiences a phase transition, and it's a very interesting. So this thing appeared recently, it actually appeared on my birthday, and back to back with uh, related work by Ali Jazdani, okay, with using two different techniques we found very similar conclusions. So, you know, inverse compressibility, in case you're not familiar, so, you know, the, the like, compressibility is D and D mu, okay, how does the charge density change as you change the chemical potential, and in the single particle picture is proportional to the density of states, we measure inverse compressibility, D mu dn, so an energy gap shows as a peak. A Dirac-like dispersion shows as a one over square root of n dependent peak. Superconductivity has no obvious signal because it's not, it doesn't open a thermodynamic gap in the density of states. So we can do this actually scanning. So we scan an SCT over a magic angle graphene device. This device has a, a range of twist angles so that they can look and explore at for different twist angles what is the compressibility. And if you measure the MUDN, uh, the most salient features are these peaks due to the band insulator gaps and the peak at charge neutrality, and then we have extra features at each integer. This, by the way, we can also do transport, so this is a superconducting device. You can see in transport it exhibits correlated states at two holes and two electrons per wire unit cell. So now, this is, you know, the basic feature. When you measure the inverse compressibility, you have these peaks at the band insulator, this peak at charge neutrality, and then you have a series of sawtooth peaks, you know, at each integer, you know, or close to each integer, which is telling you that the system is experiencing, you know, a phase transition from right before to right after, okay? If you look at, if you integrate the signal to look at the chemical potential, you can see that the chemical potential is going in steps at each integer, okay? These data are at finite field, but we have also data now in higher quality samples at zero field where all of this is reproduced again. Now, I'm, I'm going a bit quick, but please ask me questions. This is, by the way, something that happens up to temperatures we know now of at least 30 Kelvin. So it's a much higher temperature phenomenon than the correlated insulators or superconducting, you know, typical superconducting states that we see, okay? This is something that occurs above at very high temperatures already. And the way we understand this, and this is my last, you know, pretty much my last slide, is that, you know, from charge neutrality, we have these four flavors, you know, in the simplest, case, you can think of them as spin and valley, okay? And you feel in, when you start filling your system, the chemical potential is rising in all four flavors at the same time. But when you are close to one electron per mole unit cell, so when you're close to one quarter of an electron in each of these flavors, the system decides to spontaneously break the symmetry and choose one particular flavor, polarizing to one flavor, and the other three flavors go close to charge neutrality. Okay, so it goes like this, and then the occupancy of three flavors go down, and then one goes up. Then you have this peak, which then, you know, the peak is because you go back to low density of states here of these three other flavors feeling the charge neutrality. And then the story starts again. You start feeling these three flavors when you are close to one third of an electron per flavor, so almost close to two total electrons per mole unit cell. The system now spontaneously chooses these two flavors, and the other two get empty etc., etc. So we call this a cascade of phase transitions and Dirac revivals because the system goes close 
to charge neutrality again. And this explains several you know, puzzles that we had already seen in our original paper. For example, the degeneracy of the lambda levels. Why is it out of the correlated insulated state for two, like, two holes per mole in itself? What is the lambda degeneracy two instead of four? Well, it's because now you have two empty flavors and you're filling two flavors rather than all four flavors as you do when you go from charge neutrality, okay? So this also happened in the Fermi surface reconstruction. I don't have time to speak about this. So what we have now in this phase diagram is that on top of it, we have at high temperatures already, a flavor symmetry broken parent state. And this correlated insulated state, the superconductivity, et cetera, the maticity, et cetera, happens in this background of this flavor symmetry broken parent state, which sets in at temperatures of order 30 Kelvin and even above. So with this, this is the summary. I, you know, I, I, I already told you about all this. I just want to mention that there is very substantial sensitivity of all of this physics to the precise twist angle, okay? And to also twist angle disorder and chemical potential disorder. And with this, I want to acknowledge my collaborators, my you know, grad student, Jun Sao, Daniel, and Jane, theory collaborators. You know, the, the cinematicity thing it has been a pleasure to collaborate with one of our organizers. And uh, the compatibility studies have been done together with the uh, Wiseman people and also Berlin. And I didn't show you uh, about twist, mapping twist angle design with Telesaldo, but another set of very interesting uh, results that we recently published. And I want to thank you for your attention. All right. Um, okay, so um, there were a lot of questions asked. Um, let me first go with uh, two questions that were asked in the chat window towards the end. Um, one of them was from Eduardo, uh, but also from, I, I, I was also curious about this, um, uh, what you attributed to pneumatic, this, uh, the region of higher uh, resistivity. Yeah. It seemed to go almost vertically, so we couldn't quite see where it starts in temperature. Uh, okay. Let me... uh, do you know where, where it starts? Like, do you know do you so, see, do you know the T pneumatic? Oh. Yeah, so let me, let me tell you, okay. So let me actually go to the slide that I, where I showed the high temperature at the beginning. All right, if I look at this, okay. So you can see that this feature goes up to about, you know, this, it's a recognizable feature up to at least 20 Kelvin, okay. Now, if I look at the RFSY, Okay, data, the, uh, the RxY data, and let me actually normalize it so that it, it's a bit easier and correct it. There is some presence, you know, up to 10, you know, Kelvin or so, 10, 15 Kelvin, okay? So the, the effect becomes very strong below, you know, five, you know, eight Kelvin, something like that. There is some presence of this up to higher temperature. I'm not sure exactly how to define, you know, how to define kinematic for that. Now, I should also mention that right above the superconducting dome, there seems to be a, a range where, you know, we still have some presence, you know, especially if you normalize it, you know, of pneumaticity here, which is a little bit above TC, okay? Well, so, again, I'm not sure exactly how to, how to define that, but it could be that, you know, the pneumatic fluctuation before superconductivity sets in, which is something that is probably expected, you know, but it's hard to quantify experimentally exactly how that happens. So this 15 or so Kelvin where it's kind of turning on, this Eduardo asked a follow question, um, which is going to be the last question from Eduardo, to be fair to everybody. <laughs> but um, that seems to be pretty close to your flavor symmetry breaking on set, which is 20. So could there be any relation between the two scales? No? It could, it could be, okay? Uh -huh. it could be very much. Okay. But, but you don't know. Yeah, we, we, you know, we're not sure if that's the case. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when you have this okay. phase transition, I want, uh, you know, let me go to, let me go to this. Okay. So this is actually a hidden slide I didn't show, but, you know, you can make a simple theory, you know, model, which, you know, you can look in our paper about how this happens, you know, how all this happens and what different features in compressibility correspond to, to this feeling. You know, some of these phase transitions, okay, they can lead to, for example, phase separation, perhaps, you know, and it might be, you know, in that direction, some isotropy, you know, 
which has to do with phase separation. There are lots of things that, you know, we need more detailed studies to find out, you know, to what extent they correspond or not. You know, certain features that we see in transport with certain features that we see in compressibility. Okay. Um, I have one more question from the chat, but then I will move on to letting people ask themselves. So um, everybody, all the participants, if you have questions you want to ask directly, now you can raise your blue hand, and in the order of raising your blue hand, you'll get a chance to speak. Uh, last person from the chat window was Greg Bobinger asking about the, um, about the, um, the onset. Where is it? Uh, the Cascade and Dirac revivals, are, are they driven by exchange interactions? Mm -hmm. Very good. So in this, in this paper, okay, in our paper, we had this zeroth order theory model, okay, where we, we say, you know, well, the band structure of magic and graphene is too complicated. Let us just make it, you know, Dirac and then it stops. Okay, this is the effective model for the band structure. And then we include, you know, on-site Coulomb interactions. And just with those two ingredients, okay, if you are above a critical Coulomb interaction strength, you are able to reproduce some of the features, okay? So in compressibility in particular, I went a little bit fast through this, but you see that there is this, you know, smooth decrease Dirac-like, then it reaches, you know, then the compressibility reaches close to zero, and then again, a rapid rise, and then a smooth decay. That thing, you are able to, you know, that level of feature you're able to explain with the zero or the model, okay? A smooth decay, then close to zero, then rapid rise, smooth decay. That you can explain just with that. Now, as we are doing, making better measurements in better samples, and as we are trying to reproduce, you know, to explain more and more features more closely, for example, we're realizing that exchange interactions are actually quite important. Okay. Um, now I'm going to the questions, uh, people who will be patiently waiting with their blue hands raised. I'm sure their arms are hurting. Uh, the first person who raised hand was Adi Stern. So Adi, you can ask now. Uh, you can unmute yourself. Adi, you can unmute yeah. yourself. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yes. Yep. Go uh, ahead. So, yep. uh, so I wanted to ask about the, the nematicity. It seems that the principal axis of the receivity or, or the sign of uh, uh, O1 and O2 changes as you change temperature. So you raise the temperature and somehow the whole thing rotates, the ellipse rotates. Do you understand that? Uh, let me see. Do you mean here? Uh, I think one, uh, a couple uh, uh, slides forward. Uh, no, well, yeah, here for example, yeah, no, uh, the one you just erased, yeah, this one. So, so, oh, here, so if, if I, you are, I, if I go here vertically down, right, it changes exactly, from blue, from blue to red. Yeah, exactly. So, hmm. so the sign changes. Which means the the principal axis rotates <laughs> as a function of temperature, which I thought was uh, pretty. So you can you can see okay you can see that this feature this resistive feature in the normal state just in RxX measurement is actually bent. We call it yeah after a banana okay. Mm -hmm. So this has indeed a temperature and density dependence okay. It doesn't stay fixed this feature and therefore this feature also is bended. Okay, so yeah, but also the direction is bended. So, so the uh, the sign of O one minus O two, the sign of the um, difference between the resistivities in the two axes, changes as you as you just change temperature without touching the the, the density. Yeah, that you know, right? that it's is pre there. We're not sure what the reason is. Okay, mm -hmm. now as I mentioned, we we suspect that the origin of this normal state nematic region is different from the origin of the superconducting state nematicity because yeah. the regions here where we measure nematicity there's nothing in the normal state okay now yeah. near these two when one is next to the other something in particular this is a feature that happens right above 
the superconducting dome, right? So whatever pneumatic fluctuations are giving you to something, you know, are going to about to give you pneumaticity in the superconducting dome. What are those? How are those interacting with these fluctuations? You know, with what's happening in the normal state? We don't know. Okay, but indeed, we have thought yeah. that that happens right at the boundary there. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Next, next question is from um, Steve Kivelson. Um, yeah. So yeah. the the schematic you gave us at the beginning uh, seemed pretty strongly particle hole symmetric about the charge neutrality point. But the mm -hmm. data you showed didn't look so. Things were seemed to be more dramatic on the holdout side. Does one have a feeling for what the sources are of particle hole asymmetry, or or is that not true? Am I uh, yeah. not what, seeing what, correctly? What 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 data are you referring to? Well, just the, the no, this is schematic. Or? But when you showed your data, it they didn't look the same on both sides. The strength of many features, so yeah. it's here, there. Do you mean here or do you mean in the compressibility? Well, it's actually yeah. both. Either, just that this doesn't look symmetric about the yeah. uh, charge very neutrality. Much, very much. So this is something that has been observed by every group experimentally. It's very clear now, you know, that it's very different. For example, high STC is always for, you know, Two holes per more unit cell plus extra holes. Okay, and then sometimes you see here you have a small superconducting dome, and then sometimes you have other domes, and they depend TC. But the strength of the correlated insulated states very different for electrons and for holes. So there is two types of particle hole asymmetry. One is with respect to charge neutrality, but then also around each integer uh, number of electrons or holes per more unit cell, there is also particle hole symmetry asymmetry. Okay. No, but that's okay. The simple model you described has no particular symmetry about those points, so there's no reason not to have asymmetry about those. But I just the the simple yeah. cartoon you gave us uh, seemed like it should be particle hole symmetric about uh, charge neutrality. Yeah, it's not. If you look at if you look at the band structure already at the level of band structure from charge neutrality is strongly asymmetric. I see. And for holes. So already at the level of band structure is quite asymmetric. Now, whether that is enough to justify the strong asymmetries that we see, we don't know. Okay. Let me, so where does that asymmetry come from in the band structure? So, you know, the electronic structure of uh, bilayer of, of graphene itself is actually, you know, it's, it's you know, it looks like this Dirac cone at low energies, but it has a lot of Asymmetry at high energies, which comes from you know the next nearest level hopping and things like this. Uh -huh. All of that high energy structure falls into low energy when you make a more super. I see. And uh, I think that that's part of the uh, where this uh, strong asymmetry comes from. So and then maybe this ties on to something which you know I, I wanted to mention, but I had a hidden slide, which is that we don't know yet. You know what is the best definition of magic angle, as, as I showed you, you know, there is actually a, a range of angles for which magic happens, you know, superconductivity and other things. So it could be, you know, the angle for which the Fermi velocity is zero or minimum at the K point, which is what originally McDonald said, but it could be the angle for which the bandwidth is minimum, which is a different angle than this one, if you calculate it, you know, in the single particle level, or it could be the angle for which locally momentum space, the band structure is flattest, okay? which is different also from these two angles. And it is different from where is flattest the band structure in the balance band and in the conduction band from charge neutrality because they're asymmetric, okay? So how all of these things now correlate with the strongest correlated insulator states or the highest disease, you know, and for what feelings, it's, it's still very much, you know, we don't have a connection between these things yet with the board theory. All right, on that yeah. note of giving more assignments to theorists, um, I think we should thank Pablo again and end Pablo's talk. Yeah, thank you, Pablo. That was awesome. <laughs>